Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Jenna Burbich, and I'm a program officer at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Welcome to this evening's program, The Situation Room, Global Policy Making in the White House. Before I introduce our speaker, please note, today's event is on the record and is being live streamed. We always welcome social media engagement, but please silence your phones. The Council is an independent and nonpartisan platform, and views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Thank you also to our members in attendance today. Your support is critical to our work. If you are not yet a member, please consider joining. We have a wide range of levels for you to choose from. Later, we will be taking audience questions from the room and online at chi.cnf.io, and the link should also appear on the screens. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our, spe our speaker this evening, Ambassador David Sheffer is the Mayor Brown Robert A. Hellman Professor of Law and Director of the Center for International Human Rights at Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law. He was the first U.S. Ambassador at Large for War, Crime, war Crimes Issues, serving from 1997 to 2001, and he led the U.S. delegation to the U.N. talks, establishing the International Criminal Court during the 1990s. His latest book, The Sit Room in the Theater of War and Peace, provides a behind the scenes look into policy making in the White House's most guarded room, the Situation Room, where in the early 90s, he worked on the National Security Council's Deputies Committee during the first term of the Clinton administration in devising a strategy to end the deadliest conflict in Europe since World War II, the Bosnian War. Tom Glayton of National Public Radio describes the sit room as a classic of diplomatic history. The book will be available for sale and signing from the bookseller following the program, so make sure you grab a copy. And I will be back on stage to moderate the audience Q&A, but for now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ambassador David Sheffer. Well, first, thanks for coming through the, the weather uh, to, to be here tonight. I deeply appreciate it. And I do want to thank uh, Jenna for that very kind introduction, and thanks to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for hosting this book talk. <clears throat> it's always a great pleasure to speak here and to participate in its many meetings. I particularly want to thank President Evo Dalder, about whom I'll have a bit more to say shortly, and the team here, including not only uh, Jenna, but also Brian Hansen and Matthew Abbott and others. And thanks to the bookseller for organizing the book sale. I want to introduce all of you to the illustrator of the book, Julie Murphy, sitting on the front row. Julie, stand up. You got to stand up. <laughs> Rather than recycle boring old photographs of the players in the book, I decided I would use an illustrated portrait of each one. And Julie is my Chicago illustrator, whose work is gaining more and more recognition. I hope this book helps in that cause. And I am so pleased that my editor at Oxford University Press, Blake Ratcliffe, flew in from New York, braving the ice storm at O'Hare for this event. He will actually be walking in late, but we do expect him. My book, The Sit Room in the Theater of War and Peace, is the story of a three-year conversation. It took place largely at one table, in one room, the Situation Room, or as its veterans call it, the Sit Room, under the more fabled rooms and offices of the West Wing of the White House, as events during 1993 through 1995 cascaded towards atrocities, land grabs, and political standoffs in the Balkans. The Sit Room is the most powerful room in the world, in the most powerful nation in the world. So what is said there, what is deliberated there, what is decided there, can make and has made huge impacts on the course of this country's foreign and military policy and of humankind globally. I wanted to bring the drama of the sit room to life 
because I was a player in that room for four years, 1993 through 1996, during the first term of the Bill Clinton administration. We also know that under the current administration, president and national security advisor, the sit-room deliberations have reportedly become infrequent and something of a lost art in how foreign policy is arrived at in the new age of policy by tweet. We do know that Omarosa Manigault was called down to the sit-room by former Chief of Staff John Kelly to be informed she was being fired. President Trump brought congressional leadership down to the sit-room three times during the government shutdown in the past month to cut a budget deal, meetings that normally would be taking place in the Roosevelt Room or the Cabinet Room. So recalling how thorough and yet f frustrating real foreign policy making can be in a room built for that exercise remains instructive. In my time, the sit-room was one Spartan room. Today, it's a set of rooms renovated during the George W. Bush administration with high-tech screens and data sources dominating the setting. In the 1990s, the sit room was a wood-paneled, small, windowless basement conference room with two cathode ray TV screens shielded by wooden cabinet doors where secure video feeds could be watched. The computer technology next door in the White House Communications Center was vintage 1980s. Those sitting at the sit-room table, which only accommodated 10 chairs, did not gaze at laptops, iPads, cell phones, or computer screens. We looked at old-fashioned paper documents, and actually each other as we conversed. And our notepads <clears throat> look like this. It was a refreshing dialogue, stripped bare of electronic feeds, and even for someone as claustrophobic as me, I ignored that malady and found the sanctum of the sit room an exhilarating hour or two hours excursion into an intellectual feast of policy making. I was on the deputies committee of the National Security Council, and my boss, Madeleine Albright, was a member of the principals committee, namely the most senior national security cabinet officials. Since Albright was the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations during Clinton's first term, she claimed her seat along with the Secretaries of State and Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Director of the CIA, the Attorney General, the Vice President's top foreign policy advisor, the Deputy National Security Advisor, and of course, the National Security Advisor, Tony Lake. The Deputies Committee consisted of the Deputy Secretaries of State and Defense, the Deputy Director of the CIA, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, sometimes the Deputy Attorney General, and the Deputy National Security Advisor, Sandy Berger. I was sui generis, Albright's Senior Advisor and Legal Counsel, but stationed in her State Department office. So I got tapped for the sit-room duty as her de facto deputy for four years of meetings of deputies alone and principals with their plus one, namely their deputies, usually many times each week. We dealt with a host of other issues as well, North Korea and near war with it in 1994, Somalia, Haiti, Russia, Iraq, China, arms control, intelligence matters, Rwanda and Central Africa, and the Middle East. But no issue so dominated our time and generated so many briefing papers and intelligence reports as did Bosnia. So I center the story in my book about the sit room and how policy has been debated there during the Bosnian war in a sort of three act narrative play with act one being 1993, act two being 1994, and the three scene act three covering the very busy year of 1995. Indeed, I flirted with the idea of trying to write a play rather than a historical memoir with 10 characters around the sit room table slugging it out. My better angels said, don't even try to go there. Then I thought of writing this as historical fiction, but my common sense and editor said my utter inexperience with fiction writing would reveal itself very quickly. Evo Dolder wrote a brilliantly insightful book, and this is it about making America's policy in the Balkans during these years, entitled Getting to Dayton, the Making of America's Bosnia Policy, published in 2000 by the Brookings Institution. Now, Evo was on the staff of the National Security Council at the time, worked the issue very hard, and had a front row seat for much of this period, 
When you read my book, you will see that I quote liberally from Evo's path-breaking account. I use the opportunity in my book to develop the story several steps further, to dig deeper with newly declassified intelligence briefings, memoranda, and policy papers, and of course, the raw dialogue at the sit-room table drawn from my own personal notes. Evo's book is the foundation stone of mine and deserves high praise for its own dive at diplomatic history while Bill Clinton was still president. So what you would read in my book is the highly classified dialogue that occurred in the sit room among the most powerful individuals in the Clinton administration on matters of foreign policy and national security. There is authentic dialogue throughout, and it has never before been recorded and consolidated so thoroughly and brought to the public's attention so directly as you will find in the book. And that goes for any sit-room dialogue since the room was created following the Bay of Pigs disaster in the John F. Kennedy administration. You virtually hear the voices of Tony Lake, Madeleine Albright, William Perry, Colin Powell, John Shalakashvili, Warren Christopher, Jim Woolsey, Sandy Berger, Leon Firth, Al Gore, Bill Clinton, Wesley Clark, Richard Holbrook, Bob Frazier, Strobe Talbot, David Gergen, Chris Hill, Barry McCaffrey, George Stephanopoulos, and many others, even me occasionally. What is supposed to happen in the sit room? The National Security Council controls the process. The Deputies Committee is chaired by the Deputy National Security Advisor and typically is the group that first takes up the foreign policy issues, which can be military in character. If the deputies cannot reach consensus, the issue is kicked up to the Principals Committee, chaired by the National Security Advisor, that meets less frequently. The principals can include the President and Vice President in the room, and sometimes that happens, but usually not. When they are not in the room, the vice president would be represented by his foreign policy advisor, and then the national security advisor likely would represent the interests of the president, or at least be reporting directly to the president with the outcome of the meeting. A lot of prep work goes into these meetings, including the National Security Council and in the agencies represented at the table. I always would prepare a memorandum for Ambassador Albright prior to a principal's meeting, and that memo would reflect what I had gleaned were the positions emerging from the other agencies and my own advice on how to select among policy options. For my own meetings with the deputies, I would undertake a similar exercise, check in with Albright for last minute guidance, and gather critical information from my colleagues at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations. I had boundaries within which, within which I spoke to reflect Albright's views and the interests of USUN while keeping a sharp eye on how Albright fit within the State Department's overall view of the situation. But I could speak independently of state at the table and sometimes did, including articulating Albright's own bold take on an issue, which of course she frequently expressed herself at the principal's meetings. The sit-room meetings are essential for coherence, interagency coordination, which is vital, and projection of a singular U.S. policy. They flag issues that may be unknown to other participants. Those include the experienced military point of view, intelligence insights, and diplomatic realities. But another key factor is morality, which is rarely written into the briefing papers and intelligence reports but comes out through human interaction at the sit-room table. For example, the four individuals during my time at, uh, in the sit-room who occasionally reminded everyone of the moral issues at stake were Albright, Holbrook, David Gergen, and Leon Firth, representing Vice President Al Gore. Gergen, who you see often on CNN, attended some Bosnia meetings in his capacity as public affairs advisor to President Clinton. When the fate of the Eastern enclaves or UN safe areas in Bosnia was first questioned in the sit room, it was Gergen who asked how some had agreed to let the Eastern enclaves fall and not even proffer an argument of self-defense for them. Why did it take three years under the Clinton administration to end the Bosnian war? And why was it our responsibility to do so? I try to answer both of these questions as they frame the entire story. The sit room became an arena of shattered proposals for three years. No overall plan had enthusiastic support among each of the principals or deputies, but plans were advanced with acquiescence and often broad support. 
There also were fractured views among our European allies and the Russians, who were a vital party given their position on the UN Security Council and the fact that Serbia and the Bosnian Serbs were their natural allies. We labored under a paradox. Almost everyone at the UN and in Europe looked to Washington to discover the pathway towards peace in Bosnia. And we had the actual power to force the issue. But our influence was limited because we had no dog in the fight. In other words, we did not deploy any American soldiers to the large UN peacekeeping force, UMPRFOR. So the British and French in particular, both of whom heavily deployed to UMPRFOR, essentially swept aside much of what we put forward because our ideas often placed at risk their own soldiers on Bosnian territory. We were confronted with another paradox. The popular policy option of lift and strike, namely lift the 1991 UN embargo against all the warring parties, particularly the Bosnian Muslims, and then strike with air power to hit the Bosnian Serbs when they waged more war. Lift and strike would have resulted in UMPRFOR leaving Bosnia and Croatia. But first, a massive NATO intervention force would be required to escort UMPRFOR out of Bosnia and Croatia safely, and then itself possibly becoming embroiled in the war. American soldiers would have to be committed as part of that NATO intervention force in these countries without the benefit and safety of a peace settlement. And that would be very risky. Lift and strike was usually favored by the Bosniaks, the Bosnian Muslims, to break the arms embargo that crippled their own self-defense capabilities. While this was a nonpartisan arms embargo and it limited access by Serbia and the Bosnian Serbs to arms, it also cut off access by the Bosniaks to obtain the weapons they needed to fight the civil war against the Bosnian Serbs and during 1993 and early 1994, the Bosnian Croats. There was strong Republican, namely Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole in particular, pressure in Washington to lift the arms embargo and let the Bosniaks defend themselves. And you will see in my book how that sentiment plays out in the sit room, for there was a seesaw support for that policy among Clinton officials as well. Yet the paradoxes just piled up on us. We needed UMPRFOR on the ground as spotters for any airstrikes by NATO aircraft. Britain and France said they would withdraw from UMPRFOR, thus gutting it if we proceeded with lift and strike, as that would endanger their peacekeeping forces deployed there. So while depriving the Bosniaks of arms seemed counterintuitive, as they were in the fight for their own survival, shipping them arms and then providing some coverage and airstrikes would destroy the alliance that supported UMPRFOR and that facilitated the NATO strike option against violations of UN edicts. Further, Albright was trying to hold together tough sanctions on Libya and Iraq at the time in the Security Council. If she caved on Bosnia to lift the arms embargo, then our allies and Russia and China would abandon the sanctions against Libya and Iraq. She had to hold strong on the value of sanctions against those two countries. The lift and strike option returned repeatedly to the sit room table, and yet every time it did, it was defeated if only by a muddling through argument. The other option that repeatedly occupied our attention was the NATO extraction plan if UMPRFOR were to leave the theater. But UMPRFOR was there to ensure delivery of humanitarian aid to the Bosniaks, particularly in the safe areas in Sarajevo. Removing UMPRFOR meant turning our backs on the humanitarian needs and the additional suffering and death that would result. Unless, of course, the United States were prepared to replace UMPRFOR with its own troops and guarantee delivery of humanitarian supplies, which it was not prepared to do. So a policy of muddling through again emerged in the discussions because every option involving removal of UMPRFOR or implementing lift and strike became politically impossible and militarily unacceptable to Washington. What I'd like to do is read two extracts from the book that show you a little bit of the flavor of this. Now, this is mid-1994, September 94. We've been through a, a long slog in 94 from February onwards to try to reach a peach deal, and it had collapsed. I'm going to read this passage. It's a few paragraphs, and then a second package, passage of a couple of paragraphs. Holbrook engages. The principles reconvened on September 13, 1994. The tone at the meeting was far more emphatic than in the past. 
That may have been because Richard Holbrook, who had just been sworn in that day as the Assistant Secretary of State for European and Canadian Affairs following his stint as U.S. Ambassador to Germany, was present. I came to know Holbrook well during these years and often acted as intermediary between Albright and him, which led to occasional episodes of personality management. The dynamic between the two was challenging because Albright outranked Holbrook, both as a cabinet officer and as a member of the principals committee. I think that must have graded Holbrook at times. If Albright was busy on another matter, he did not want to wait in order to be put through to her. Sometimes he would instruct me to walk into her office and slip her a note while she was on the phone or meeting with someone else announcing, Holbrook is on hold for you. She would wrap up at her own pace and connect with him on the phone. Now Albright was the ultimate master of phone diplomacy and she handled Holbrook with efficiency and grace while seated calmly at her desk while I imagined Holbrook pacing back and forth from wherever he was calling. Holbrook was a tall, dark-haired, bespeckled, intellectually sparkling, and imposing man. He also demonstrated a certain informality at times. Feet propped up on desks and tables, cutting his nails in front of you, praising and then chiding you in front of your colleagues. That only accentuated his dis distinction from others. Holbrook was a diplomat of extraordinary skill and energy who made an enormous difference throughout his career, and in particular, America's policy on Bosnia. He was a bulldog who bulldozed his way towards solutions. Rather than create or perpetuate the problem, which many in public service do to lazily bolster their power and influence, Holbrook always tried to solve the problem. In that respect, Albright and Holbrook shared a common denominator and they often succeeded in their different ways to reach the end posts. As with Albright, I admired that trait in Holbrook and knew that when he engaged, he focused on the end game of conquering whatever policy puzzle stymied others. His inability to focus long on his counterpart's eyes during a conversation and his impatience with conventional or unimaginative thinking could be condescending. But his brilliance and limitless diplomatic drive made up for the living with Holbrook phenomenon. When he collapsed in a State Department elevator and died shortly thereafter in December 2013 at the age of 69, while trying to navigate the Afghanistan and Pakistan labyrinth for the Obama administration, America lost a diplomat for the ages. In the Situation Room that September day in 1994, Holbrook flatly predicted, as the consequence of the lack of a plausible transatlantic policy, that Srebrenica and Zeppa are gone. Lake added, Tony Lake, the National Security Advisor, added, we all assume the Eastern enclaves are gone. Those words rang in my ears for months thereafter and bore truth 10 months later as Srebrenica and then Zeppa fell. Shalakashvili, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, seemed seemingly oblivious to Lake's comment, calmly reiterated that he had no idea how NATO would exercise air power if Umpurfor left, because there would be no ground controllers to spot the targets. And then the conversation continued that day in the sit room. Now here's my second extract. Shattered proposals. <clears throat> the principals met on November 28 to survey the field of shattered proposals, otherwise known as Bosnia. This is in 1994. Albright joined by secure video conference from New York while I sat at the table in the sit room. The familiar terrain of the multilateral lift proposal, unleashing NATO airstrikes, and assisting with the withdrawal of Umpurfor dominated the long discussion. The fate of Bihać in northern Bosnia hung in the balance as Bosnian Serb forces closed in on it. Lake summed up the initial musings over the futility of doing anything in the absence of a ceasefire with the Bosnian Serbs by saying the United States could not promise much. In particular, he saw no way to launch strategic bombing to force a Bosnian Serb withdrawal without NATO unity on the policy. The, viola the viability of any close air support depended on whether NATO first took out 
the Bosnian Serbs' anti-aircraft weapons. Once again, it was David Gergen who made the obvious moral point. Don't we have an obligation to the people of Bihaj? There are US Marines offshore to rescue our own, but not even unperforced soldiers. Does that make sense? Christopher reiterated that we had a long-standing commitment to help Umfrafor, and we could not walk that back now. Lake and Shalikashvili clarified, yes, but not with U.S. ground forces. Albright and Lake entered into a verbal duel, with Albright trying to maintain the safe areas as demilitarized areas, and Lake telling her to stop trumpeting the safe areas. The United States, the, the United Nations failed to protect them. Albright countered, we have to do something up here in New York. She meant the United States had to step forward with a proposal to ensure the security of the safe areas. Lake poured cold water through the video waves. What are you prepared to do about it? She responded sharply, Tony, don't destroy the United Nations in the process. Lake speculated, I, I surmised more out of frustration than logic, about allowing the Bosnian Serbs to form some sort of confederation with Serbia. Albright sparred about the fate of Sarajevo and the eastern safe areas. It would have gotten more contentious, but for Defense Secretary William Perry's intervention, which pointed to an answer, at least for the principals on that particular day. Perry said in his professorial tone, and I conclude with this uh, extract, we need a revitalizing approach to this problem. Our policy has been to contain this war, provide humanitarian aid, limit the violence, enforce the no-fly zone, and ensure that NATO will protect the exclusion zones. We have accomplished little more than limit some of the violence. We have very little leverage to affect Serbian behavior. We are unable to use airstrikes as leverage. We are unlikely to force a peace plan. We have two near-term decisions. First, no peace plan works with the unilateral lift, and we need to confront the Republicans on the Hill with that reality. Second, we need to repair the damage to NATO. That means assisting UMPRFOR troops if they get into trouble, and that any airstrikes we launch will be robust, not token in character. They must be credible strikes. This adds up to a muddling through strategy but there is no alternative. The real key was to force the parties, and that included not only the Serbs, but also Croats and Bosnians, or Bosniaks, to the negotiating table again and again, but to be prepared to use air power to compel the Serbs in particular to cooperate in reaching a settlement. That kind of military force was not used until mid-1995 following the Srebrenica genocide, and then the Mercalli marketplace bombing in Sarajevo in August 1995. Air power before then was employed in response to Serb violations of various UN exclusion zones, earlier mortar attacks, threats to the security of Umpurfor, and other provocations. Using air power to compel negotiations finally came of age in late summer 1995. It's an option Albright had advocated more than two years earlier. The dance between use of force and diplomacy continued throughout the war, and the UN peacekeeping presence prevented a full use of military power. But it's also true that Allied reluctance to use force, be it the Europeans or the Americans, placed an enor enormous burden on the diplomatic track. That's similar indeed to what we saw in Syria in the early years, 2011, 12, 13. These were complex equations to master, and my book tries to shed enough light on the process to provide historical insight, and I think a good story, to help build and guide future policymakers. While the process was intensively comprehensive in its deliberative character, that process needs to be married with breakthrough moments, with bold ideas, with taking a gamble at times. What the book demonstrates is that American leadership matters, but so too does multilateral partnership. This is let's make a deal done the hard but right way. In hindsight, I wager that the war could have been brought to closure sooner with forthright use of military air power or US commitment with troops on the ground, as that would have given us much greater influence and leverage. <laughs>
The fact that we policymakers in the sit room tolerated the siege of Sarajevo for four years, 1992 through 1995, while seeking a peace settlement remains on many levels inexplicable. In the end, peace, however fragile but enduring, was achieved in Bosnia only because the United States remained engaged and finally took commanding leadership of the process in 1995. In the epilogue to the book, I write about some observations of mine, but also lessons learned from those sit-room deliberations, which can help guide the future. I'm just going to tick them off very, very quickly without explaining them. First, we have to recognize in history that sometimes peace negotiations lasted for an extremely long time, and relatively speaking, three years stands up pretty well. Um, I think it's sometimes the deputies and the principals should invite a psychologist or a psychiatrist to the table. I mean, I'm serious. Um, we need to understand the mindset of perpetrators of atrocities and aggressors. We need to understand how they are thinking. And that isn't something that we really know, the, the mystery of the mind. We need their expertise at the table. Um, bold ideas should be um, invited at the sit-room table. Uh, it's not a table for the path of least resistance. It's very tempting to muddle through without factoring in the immediate plight of, of thousands, hundreds of thousands of civilians, but their plight does need to be uh, front and center. Morality should be spoken more often. Um, we should have uh, before us at all times the cost of what we're doing and what we're not, what we're, the cost of, of not doing things. Uh, that should be a running ledger in front of us. If you perpetuate the Bosnian War for three more years, well, here's the cost to your budget. Here's the cost to try to rebuild cities again, the cost of repatriating refugees to that country again, if you continue this for another three years. You should have that, that estimate of costs in front of you, not just the costs in the next budget cycle of what is it going to cost to deploy US air power at bases in Italy, et cetera. What's that cost? Well, of course, you can quantify that. But the cost of not doing what might be advisable to do also should always be before you. There's no false equivalency of atrocities. If one side is committing more atrocities than the other, then someone has to say it at the table. Um, I think it's deeply immoral for ethnic cleansing to be rewarded with secession. I'm a scholar of this principle of self-determination, but if you do it through ethnic cleansing and incredible flow of atrocities, then you lose your right to secession. Um, where are we today under the Trump administration? Let's put aside the political grandstanding in the sit room during the government shutdown. We recently learned that a new Deputy National Security Advisor, Charles Kupperman, has arrived at the White House after the last one, Mira Ricardel, left in November at the insistence of Melania Trump. So perhaps Deputies Committee meetings can resume with more frequency. Reportedly, National Security Advisor John Bolton rarely convenes the Principals Committee, occasionally preferring one-on-one -on -one conversations with principals, at least those who are still on deck. The state of America's foreign policy is in free fall, and the national security issues are virtually piling up on the sit-room table, surrounded by the ghosts of the past, and not necessarily the real policymakers of the present, however qualified or newly invested they may be. The fiasco over Syria policy in recent weeks signaled to me that the issues simply had not been filtered through the policy process of the deputies and principals in that room, nor is there much confidence that other critical foreign policy issues have been vetted thoroughly and professionally in the room. I could go through that list, but it's very long. I close with this thought. Never before in the near 60-year history of the sit room would one need to seriously consider putting the sitting president's performance or lack thereof on the table for discussion as undermining the national security of the United States and the fate of the Western Alliance. But we have reached that moment. Members of Congress speak about this issue. Our allies express their concerns. Commentators swarm all around it. <laughs> 
but I seriously doubt that any meeting of the deputies or principals has been convened to discuss secretly this most obvious dilemma involving the president himself, to put it bluntly. It sends chills up my spine to even ponder this point, but the professional governance of this nation, framed in so many respects in the sit room, demands it. The final sentence of the book's introduction puts it rather bluntly. Those entering the sit room face this reality, that people in peril will survive with hope or slide deeper into despair, depending on what officials decide over the next few hours in that historic room to uphold the integrity of America's place in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Schaeffer. We have some time for some questions now. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Wait for me to call on you. Um, speak into the mic and make sure your question is a question. Okay. All right. Any questions? This gentleman in the third row. The mic's coming. The mic's on its way. What's the breakdown between Muslims and Christians? It seems to be a problem in that area. Tito kept them together, but now it came apart. Yeah. Well, of course, the, um, uh, I mean, the breakdown between them was rather astonishing as it began in 1990, 91, 92, because prior to that time, under Tito's leadership, Frankly, the Christians and the Muslims had gotten along quite well together. I say that very generally, but having been in the region many, many times and known so many people there, and of course going through this, um, it was astonishing to me the reality that prior to this breakout, there were enormous intermarriages between the two faiths. They worked together. They fought together in the Yugoslav army. They composed music together. They went to theater together. They went to school together. They went to university together. Um, there was a far more unified sense of the religions within the former Yugoslavia while it was Yugoslavia. And I do, uh, you know, lame the blame on leaders who used that issue of religious distinction to fuel the flames of their own power. And of course, Slobodan Milosevic is one of those individuals. I mean, one can also analyze, you know, the way in which uh, President Izabekovic conducted himself throughout the war. Obviously, by then, the separation had become very dramatic, and he sought to defend his, his Islamic constituency and it became much more accentuated. But I am convinced that there was no necessity for a religious breakup among Croatia, Bosnia, and Serbia. There was, there was reason for a political breakup, but not a religious one. That was fueled by individuals who saw it as a vehicle towards power. Yes, the gentleman on the, I think it's the fourth, fifth row. Given that 80% uh, of Americans don't have a passport, it seems uh, understandable that we have a populist president. How can our leaders engage the American public to be more concerned about international affairs? Well, first of all, um, it would be very helpful for any dialogue out of Washington by our leaders to be stated with a far more respectful and thorough understanding of the international issues as opposed to what has become, unfortunately, the reality of the last two years, which is one of a condemnatory and critical and, um, well, sort of not necessarily isolationist, but a sense of, of, um, of withdrawal. Um, and why, why withdraw from our allies? Why endanger the future of NATO? Uh, what are your reasons for that? Foreigners, you know, look at us, and I, I spend a f great deal of time overseas, and um, we have a problem. The United States is becoming irrelevant. Mm 
I'm serious. You can sit at any dinner table with your friends overseas, and the conversation very rarely now centers on the United States as part of a problem solving or problem or part of looking at world issues and dealing with them. They just pass us by now. And it's been remarkable how this has occurred in the last two years. So um, uh, if our leadership is um, sort of isolating us in that manner, I can see how a great many Americans can be swept up in the, well, what's the point of going overseas? What's the point of having a, a passport? If our own leadership, uh, frankly, is rarely going overseas and is maligning our closest friends. Obviously, that has an impression on the American public. Not everyone in the public, obviously, but it has an impression on enough so that uh, that uh, statistic can, can bear fruit. And I know so many stories that you've just indicated, you know, people who you would have thought had a passport, and then you find out that they're 50 year, 40, 54 or 55 years old and they don't have a passport yet. And I, I find it astonishing, but um, uh, it is the reality in this country. For those watching at home, you can also ask a question on conferences.io, type in chi.cnf.io. There's a few questions coming online, so I'm just going to ask a question online and then take it back to the audience. Um, how effective do you think the date and peace agreement is now? It's been 24 uh, years since the war. It stopped the war in 1995. It created two entities, Republika Srpska, Federacija. You have Republika Srpska wanting to secede, a youth drain. What do you think um, is the situation now, and how effective do you think the peace agreement is now? I am the first to recognize the criticism of the Dayton Accords. One lives with it almost every day. Um, it has left uh, Bosnia in a precarious state today, um, not one that is unified, but one that is still fractured. What it did accomplish, and I think we need to recognize this in the Dayton Accords, is that it did literally stop the fighting. I mean, the fighting did end. Now, did it, it, it created government that uh, was dependent on consensus, essentially, and that's very difficult among these parties, uh, the three entities of Bosnia, or the two entities, uh, the Federation and uh, Republic Srpska. Uh, and I've witnessed that very close, uh, that, that dilemma, that reality. Um, could Dayton have been more, more perfectly conceived and, and uh, finalized and signed? Uh, of course. Um, having lived through the Dayton process, though, I was back in the State Department with it every day while others were in Dayton. Um, I do know that I just don't know if it could have been negotiated more perfectly than it actually was. In other words, one can sit today and say, well, it should have had the following provisions. It should have had the following, strip the following checks and balances out so that the government can operate more efficiently. Um, but at the time, uh, the give and take among Tuzman, Milosevic, and Izabekovic was such that uh, the Dayton Accords are a, very much what they could agree to. Uh, and not more. Um, and my book talks about this some. It also provides a very, uh, I hope, very interesting end note, because there was too much to actually put in the text, that there's an end note of the daily sit reports out of Dayton, which you'll find very interesting to read, uh, and which were recently declassified. So I, I think the point I want to make about Dayton, I find it very disturbing, and this perhaps is the, the, the failure of Dayton, uh, if, if one wants to identify failures, that it has perhaps helped perpetuate a culture of denial in parts of Bosnia, denial about what occurred during the war, because it has left the, the country fractured politically and I think provided the, the, the ground for, for denial to take place. And, um, and that's very unfortunate. OK. The gentleman in the second row. Thank you. Um, President Trump has recently been calling for the uh, 
for the NATO allies and the Europeans uh, to, to start spending substantially more on their own defense mm -hmm. and on their own military capacities. Now, presumably, to, presumably giving them, for example, the capacity to, to deal with more problems in their own neighborhood. Uh, you described a situation where Uniford, there were British and French troops on the ground, but everybody had to wait for the U.S. to do anything. Uh, would it be a, a wise thing? Would it be a, a workable thing? Uh, that if somehow the Europeans actually spent that money and actually built their own independent defense capacity, uh, could, we, could we be less, le less indispensable? Uh, could the Europeans act autonomously? Could we stop being the policemen uh, for the, the wars in everybody's neighborhood, not just our own? You know, I think the answer is yes, but I want to explain my yes, which is, uh, this is a proposal that France and, and Germany are working on very closely, i.e. creating an independent European force. And their argument is that this will nonetheless be very compatible with NATO and its military presence uh, in Europe, that there's no reason that there cannot be such an you know, independently standing force that is compatible with the NATO presence. President Trump has taken a different view of this, as I understand, uh, and has spoken uh, rather negatively about this idea. But I do think that, um, you know, what we were laboring under in the 1990s was British and, um, I mean, yeah, British uh, and French participation in a UN peacekeeping force, which is not a combat force. It's there to provide some security for certain areas, uh, and also to uh, facilitate humanitarian delivery of supplies. That's what, those were its major missions. Um, what is being discussed now is not a peacekeeping force. It's actually being discussed as a combat capable army. And I think we have only ourselves to blame over the last two years as to why this discussion is taking place in Europe, because we have walked back. We've, we've, We've undermined our own uh, allegiance to NATO from the White House itself, so no one should be surprised that this is taking place. I think the real issue that needs to be negotiated with our European friends is, well, are you able to sustain the timeline of your, of your appropriations for your own national defense as agreed to in the NATO, in the North Atlantic Council, that there would be a timeline into the early 2020s, not to build up a NATO force, but to build up your own national defense capabilities at a rate that is, is sufficient and you know, follows the formula that was agreed upon. That actually is happening. Um, President Trump has tried to accelerate all of this into a year or two years, but that was not the agreement at the end of the Obama administration. But that being said, if you build the European force, um, I think at least the argument is on the table that French forces that are committed to that European force and, and British for, uh, German forces that are committed to that force, if they're acting in a way that is, is in a collaborative fashion with NATO, that itself may be the type of military buildup that actually satisfies the NATO requirements because it is building up national defense capabilities. That's, it's not a NATO army that anyone's talking about. It's national defense capabilities. So at the end, ironically, it may actually help NATO. Great. All right, just the gentleman in the front row, Jerry Goldstone, just wait for the microphone. You've described this uh, policymaking process as being pretty messy, actually, as one might expect. You haven't talked a lot about the president's role in all mm. of this, leaving President Trump aside, yeah. what has been your experience um, on what the role of the president has been or should be yeah. in trying to drive this process toward a decision? Yeah. Excellent question. And yes, I, I didn't bring that into this discussion, but I will now. Um, of course, it was President Bill Clinton. And, um, he was an infrequent visitor to these meetings, to the Principals Committee meetings. Now, oftentimes, or I shouldn't say often, but sometimes meetings would take place with him in the White House, in the Oval Office or the Cabinet Room, 
um, with what was called the foreign policy team, which was essentially these particular cabinet officials on the principals committee. So it would be outside of the sit room context and they would meet with him in a different context in the White House. And that he seemed to prefer that a lot. I did not see him that frequently in the sit room. He would come in uh, typically for maybe 15, 20 minutes during a much longer session. He'd always have his Diet Coke can in his hand. That was just guaranteed. Um, and uh, Tony Lake would shift from his seat immediately and the president would sit at the head of the table. Um, and then uh, oftentimes Al Gore would come in as well. And, um, and yet, um, I think on, on the balance of, of the ledger, uh, it probably would have been productive for the president or President Clinton at that time to have visited the sit room meetings of the principals committee more often than he did. He relied on Tony Lake to report to him. Um, and that's, that's a procedure, you know, that was preferential to the president. Um, but it also would have, I think, been helpful at times for him just to spend that 15 or 20 minutes more frequently uh, in the principal's committee meetings than was actually the case. Now, I, I know that other presidents actually have spent more time. I know President Obama spent more time in these meetings. And um, uh, I believe President George W. Bush did as well, as my memory serves me uh, from looking at the stats. Take a quick another uh, question from Conferences I.O. What was the decisive moment or event that pushed the U.S. Um, and President Clinton to finally intervene in Bosnia? Well, it was two things. One, the Srebrenica genocide, which I write about in our, our meetings about it, our reaction to it. It stimulated a policy process that culminated in, in an early August 1995 process of, of looking at the final options for dealing with Bosnia. And it was actually Madeleine Albright's memo which became the controlling memo of that exercise. Um, but the real thing that finally tipped it was the Mercalli marketplace uh, mortar attack in late August of 1995, which was very gruesome. Scores of people were killed and many more wounded uh, in the center of Sarajevo. And that finally, uh, a decision was made to unleash air power full force against Serb, uh, Bosnian Serb targets. And, um, and then also to, to be telling Milosevic very directly, and Holbrook was in Belgrade saying to uh, Milosevic while the, the bombing was taking place, so see what's happening? Shall we now sit down and talk and get this process moving? And so finally, that was uh, uh, the process that, that triggered it all. I will say this, you know, if you go to Sarajevo, you can visit this spot in the Markali marketplace. And it's interesting because life goes on all around it. It's a marketplace, you know, flowers and vegetables and everything else are there. Um, but then there's this one little area where there's the memory of that attack memorialized there. And I, I found it, uh, well, I didn't quite know how to react because I stood there and of course everyone's just walking by it. They're going about their, bi their business. That's what people do. They get on with it years later. And here I was standing there looking at something of great significance uh, in the history of Bosnia. But it also reminded me that there's hope. You know, people can go on. They move on. Questions? There's a lady in the second row. The microphone is coming. Yeah. Hi. Um, could you expand on what happens after the moral obligations are emphasized? Because um, you mentioned that they're always brought up, but that's often not enough to incentivize uh, concrete action. So what should be done to, shall we say, further the moral purpose that might be articulated? Um, well, I can only say that um, uh, it, it does embolden those of us who are in the sit room uh, to reflect on those statements that are made by people who finally make the moral point. Um, but remember, these are, are 
deeply classified discussion. So it's not as if someone saying something in the sit room reverberates anywhere else in the world. It only reverberates among us. But quite frankly, we're the policymakers. So yes, let it reverberate among us. And I was glad every time that happened that someone had, frankly, sometimes the courage to simply look at everyone in the room and remind them what of the fate of the people who are suffering this horrendous war and these atrocities. Um, and so it has that impact, but I'm afraid it doesn't mean that it has a, a publicly displayed impact. Yes, the gentleman toward the back, I think it's third from the end. Getting, getting back to today, who's the Gergen in the White House in the sit room? Who would be the Gergen in the sit room in terms of moralist? And number two, if we had a crisis, could we fill the seats in the sit room? So who's the David Gergen today? Um, my goodness. I have, I have never thought I could answer. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I, I think through all of the uh, public affairs and communications people, it's certainly not them. Um, uh, and yet I would have thought, you know, at times if, if, uh, if the chief of staff were in the room, John Kelly, during his tenure, he could have uh, had that voice. We sometimes had John Podesta, uh, uh, chief of, or, or Rahm Emanuel, I guess at the time, was chief of staff, and he sometimes would be in the room, Rahm Emanuel would, and say, you know, blunt things. I didn't record anything that he said, but, you know, he said them uh, <laughs> in his own way. Um, and um, uh, and, and uh, I'm just trying to think if there's a George Stephanopoulos or, or even someone like that, but I, I'm afraid I, I go blank on that. In terms of... Um, of whether we could fill the sit room chairs, well, technically, yes. But I think one of the points I'm trying to make in my book is that if you read through it and you look at three years of, or two, well, actually two and a half years of what Chairman John Shalikashvili, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was saying in those meetings, the wealth of his experience um, and oftentimes the wisdom of what he was saying builds upon itself, meeting after meeting after meeting. So you want to have that experience and that legacy keep building over the, over the time that these people are in office. Another one was, of course, Defense Secretary William Perry, who I just really admired as, as sort of the wise man in the room. Um, so you need people like that who are there long enough to keep reminding everyone, well, we've been here before, or we're going through an evolutionary process here, let me explain it to you, give you my perspective, as opposed to um, uh, sort of a, a, a rotating uh, set of people who come in uh, without um, proper perspective. I'll just tell you some one little anecdote, if I may, uh, might, uh, Jenna, that, um, you know, it's interesting in these policy meetings, you enter someone like myself, uh, sort of new on the block in 1993 uh, for these types of meetings, and um, you don't really know the background of all of these very distinguished people around the table. I mean, you know who they are, you know what their job is, but you don't know what John Shalakashvili's life was like. You don't know what William Perry did in academia for you know decades and for other prior presidents. You don't really know that until you study these people get to know them better. And I find in writing this book, um, sometimes I said to myself, you know, I wish when I walked into the room I had known this about that person and his background or her background, because it could have made a difference in the discussions to sort of tug that a little bit uh, and sort of bring that person in a little more personally. So I learned a lesson about that one. Thank you so much, um, Ambassador David Sheffer. That's Thanks. all we have time for today. Um, but Ambassador Sheffer will be um, signing um, his book, um, The Sit Room in the Theatre of War and Peace. Um, so I encourage you to grab a copy. Um, thank you once again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.